I had $143 left to my name. And, and you sold it in the 90s for 15 million, right? Yeah. It's a lot of money to move through. <laughs> yeah, I was the worst on the planet. Once you know the rewards are there, that's, that's okay, that's 1% of the path. The other 99% is completely about mitigating risk. There's not a 10,000 hour rule that I have to pay attention to and, and nobody else can tell me I can't do something or I can't skip the line or this is what the line looks like if you want to succeed. Like all that's BS, like life is short. So if I want to do this, I'm going to do it. Today's guest is a best-selling author. He's an entrepreneur who's founded 20 plus companies. He's a hedge fund manager, a comedian, a podcaster, and a national chess master. And in his new book, Skip the Line, he debunks why blindly following what most people do, that is to, to fall in line, to spend 10,000 hours perfecting our craft, and then to not question the status quo. He debunks why that keeps people stuck. We talk insecurities. We talk going bankrupt, fighting writer's block, and he even tells a few jokes. You have to hear this story. So please help me welcome to the We Do Hard Things podcast, James Altucher. Just, just. Yeah, just, I know. Oh, I, I'm all about you. Oh, okay. Okay. Hard I, things. I, yes, I do. I never assume that because I don't have that big of an ego yet. But uh, here's what <laughs> I want to ask. Why not? Why not? Why don't you have? Uh, it's not like a big ego. It's like confidence. Why don't you have confidence? Listen, man. The whole premise of this show is just trying to. I'm just trying to leech as much as I can off of all y'all, so that way I can build up my confidence because. You know, so many things that you actually touch on in this book. It's like, oh man, I just keep seeing myself in it. So, uh, I don't know. I don't know, I, I don't know if I have confidence really. <laughs> well, well, we'll talk about that. That comes off the page a little bit, man, to be honest with you. Oh, good. I'm glad you, I'm glad you do saw you, that. Are you, do you, do you, I wasn't even asking this. Do, does it, do you think people approach you like you're, you've got everything figured out and stuff? Yeah, I think I think people do, and I think people get even a little. I don't want to say intimidated, um, but you know, even though I admit like all my failures and all my books, and that's kind of kept my brain off balance throughout all this. And I ha and what I write about is all the painful techniques I've had to develop and use to basically rise up and be successful again, without which just me myself would be hopeless. So I sort of view myself as basically hopeless without putting in the real work to kind of figure out how to, you know, push past the pain as, as one of the titles of your podcast is called. So, uh, you know, that's, that's how I operate. But I, I operate it, from a position of no confidence and yeah. I need to learn and ask questions and figure things out as I go along. And so I end up figuring lots of things out. So, so that's so interesting. Cause I, so in the fall, I started going to therapy cause I thought I might have like borderline personality disorder or that I might have, um, uh, bipolar because I could be the most confident person in the world. Like my wife tells me overly confident. And then at the same time, completely doubt every single decision that I've ever made. And I was mood swinging so fast. And, it, and then I found out I just have anxiety. And, and if I didn't have my anxiety under control, it looked like these kind of crazy things. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are certain things where I'm like, I'm really good at this. And then there are other things where I worry that like, I might think my, I might think too much of myself. I might think that I'm so good that I lose my, my humbleness or like, like I worry that I'll be too confident. And so I, I think I over index on the other side, maybe. Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, it, it's tricky. I have anxiety as well. You know, you know, I've gone from rich to broke from to rich to broke to rich to broke several times so that will do a lot to your anxiety because every time I have money I think okay I'm about to lose it and of course I don't think when I'm broke oh okay no problem I'm about to make it all back again like you never think that and so basically it puts me in a, a fairly permanent state of anxiety so a lot of the thinking and techniques that have gone into my books I hate to use the word techniques but a lot of the, the, the process of my life is involved in basically 
conserving my energy so it's not devoted to worry or anxiety and it is devoted to the things that will make my life better and and uh, achieve success is kind of corny but at least be the best I can be at the things that I love doing and and the, and be the best I can be for the people who I love but like like Tony, like Tony Robbins talks and, and I love the man and I, a lot actually he talks about like success leaves clues and so I've just hoped that I can out like I, I've hoped that I could stack enough wins to build enough confidence that I will won't have to worry. But but when you just said like I've made money and gone broke, I've made money, I've gone broke. When I have money, I worry. Like I still I, I worry about those things too. And I was hoping you would just say that success stacks enough that that you can think back and go, no, you know what? I did this in ninety five and that was great. And I did this in you know ninety eight and I did this in two thousand five. And I like you've you've had a crazy amount of success. How how do you still suffer from doubting yourself? Well, I think because I've seen my because several times I've said to myself, you know. Boom, that's it. I'm done. I'm done as a human. I've I've made millions. I've did this, I did that. I I did everything. And so I don't have to I don't have to be I don't have to work for it anymore. But it turns out the second you kind of give up on, you know, the process, then life is becomes hard again. And so you it have slaps to slaps you in the face, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, you have to constantly be vigilant for everything that's gonna go against go against you there's a yeah. lot of risks in in living right and we and we sort of think that we've the, you know the technology and money has like moved those risks away but but not at all i mean just being a living being on this universe yeah it has risks there's every every uh pr every predator has prey and um uh, you know and that's that's a hard it's it's hard it's hard to live in general but if you're going to live you might as well be successful at the things you love doing you might as well try to have freedom and mastery and community and and that never goes away those th feelings have nothing to do with money money is a side effect of being good at those things and and that's what you have to remember and and by the way not having those things in your life and again um let's say it's it's the mastery of something you love it's it's freedom to make your own decisions in life or as, as many as possible and it's strong community whether it's like family or or loved ones or whatever and um uh, if you don't have that, money's a side, lack of money will be a side effect as well. Yeah. Do you, so, so do you consider yourself more successful than you were in the past? Um, define success. Well, I, that's oh, okay. I, the answer that's is yes. Throwing, that's what I was throwing. Okay. So, so at least, at, at least, even though you may have anxiety and even though you may have earned a lot and lost a lot and done a lot and people look at you and they think that you got it all figured out. I mean, I... Dude, I mean, I mean, the more that I learn about you, the more I'm like, am I ready to talk to this guy? And then you show up and we're like, hey, let's have this chat about how it never goes away. Uh, but so so you have this persona that you've built up and stuff. But please tell me that that at least gives you some armor or some shield to take on the world. Right. Um, yeah, I think so. Um, you know, I have. Well, I don't know, actually, because. Uh, you know, for instance, recently I wrote, uh, an article that got a lot of, I, I, I don't like to write anything that doesn't say something unique and interesting, doesn't tell a story. And one requirement I always have is I have to be afraid of what people will think of me if I publish this article. And, you know, I do a lot of things. I have a podcast, I write articles, I'm an investor, I uh, started businesses, but I love writing. I've been doing that for 30 years, uh, 20, the past 20 professionally. And, and I'm good enough at it, I think, and maybe this is where confidence comes in, I'm good enough at it after 30 years that when I write something that's, you know, trigger some form of cognitive bias for people, then they usually express it like they hate me. And they hate you. Oh my goodness. They they do. And I don't understand I, I I 
kind of tell myself, boy, I must be really great if people are this emotional about something I wrote because I've some articles I've written. I've never even seen people react like this. They act like I um, should go to jail or something. And, you know, I just and I'm and I always have good intent when I write. Like I my one rule is to never hurt anybody when, when I write. That's my only rule. I can hurt myself, but I can't hurt anybody else. But, you know, sometimes uh this this one recently was like the most viral, painful article I had ever written. It's the one time I probably regret writing an article, even though I had extremely good intentions and life was good. Uh, but I got so much negative feedback that I think this is the first time ever and I've had a lot of controversial articles, not intentionally, like I don't intend to be controversial. I think that's bad writing when you intend to be controversial. But this one, I created such negative feedback and I was like, you know, really you are also giving me, like, you know, and I, I just kept noticing like all this that was being th thrown my way. And I finally, I think I cracked on this, on this recent one. I'm like, what, when was what this? the uh, just recently, I wrote this article called New York City is Dead Forever. Here's why. And oh, that might piss off a few New Yorkers. <laughs> yeah, pissed off about. So basically, 30 million people read the yeah. article. So it was the most right. viral article, not only have I ever written, but it was the most viral article I have ever seen. And 30 million people read it. I mean, just the other day, Joe Rogan quoted it on his podcast and that's and i wrote this in august and it's march now and but that's it's still like going viral i still get like hate mail every day but so 30 million people read it and about five percent of those 30 million people hated it and the rest either liked it or were fine with it but you know five percent of 30 million is like a million and a half people and they all let me know how much they hated it like that's that was the issue and that was that was kind of painful for me not just because i don't care about the average stranger who hates something because they might who, who knows who they are or what their agenda is but it was like family members it was friends it was ex-employees it was people i had done favors for and i was just like really this is happening and i kind of it, it kind of broke me a little bit not in the sense of confidence but i'm like man this is not how I want. I didn't sign up for this. And yeah. I kind of got burnt out for a little while. And then I was thinking, what were you hoping? What were you hoping? So, so, cause this is the thing that, that sucks the wind, like those moments where you have to catch your breath when you realize, cause you, you've been taken so by surprise. So what were you hoping you were, you would do with that article? Cause certainly you're going to put something out. You're going to say only what you can say. You have a point of view. You're not, you're not, you know, what were you hoping would happen and how far well, from, from, from what really happened was it? Well, the, the, the first thing is I was hoping for the same thing I always hope for in every single article I ever write, which is that people will like it and maybe benefit from it. So I always try to have, um, I call this like two entryways into an article. So maybe you like the story, maybe you like the themes and the concepts I'm talking about, I always try to throw in like some critical piece of information that I think nobody knows. So like some new concept that's never been discussed so that at least you have something to talk about at cocktail parties so it seems you seem knowledgeable. And so I hope for like a bunch of things. And, and, and but I really do try to like shed knowledge on things and, and help people. And so I was hoping people would not be in denial about some of the problems that New York City was facing. And and by the way, people are still in denial about these things. It's a very weird time right now for, for all major metro areas, not just New York City. Like New York's not unique in this. And um, the people just were like, oh, he's just shitting on New York. And I'm like, no, I've, I've been trying, there's the, there's these real look at the statistics there's these real problems like i don't know what to tell you and uh everybody was just like what what the hell? like this guy is a and he's he, he he's not even from new york which is i don't know where that rumor came from i was born raised spent my life and spent the pandemic in new york but like everyone was like, he's not from, You're new, from york. new jersey according to wikipedia yeah like i was born in new york and i lived like 10 minutes from new york when i grew up and then i've been living in new york since 1994 until yesterday i moved to florida and uh uh Hold on, yesterday you moved to florida yeah are you in florida right now 
I'm in Florida right now, yeah. Oh, what part of Florida are you in? I mean, you don't have to get too specific. We don't want stalkers no, I, to find I don't care. Here. Stalkers have found me before. I'm in Key Biscayne. <laughs> oh. Are you, are you in Florida? No, it's just uh, my, uh, I, I, my family, uh, they're developers. And uh, Jensen Beach, I don't know if you're familiar with where that is on Hutchinson Island. It's on the on the east coast, just north of West Palm Beach. I've been uh, in and out of Florida for, since uh, since June, and I have, and I'm in, on an island where the beach is two blocks from me. And I'm just uh, describing this to show you how little I know about anything. <laughs> I have not been to the beach yet. <laughs> You're so, you're so, you are a New Yorker. It's true. It is. <laughs> you, you go That's to Florida. What I'm you go to Florida, and then you you don't even go to the beach. Yeah, you are a New Yorker. I, I believe you. I'm totally a New Yorker, and uh, I, I don't drive. I don't do anything, and um, and I'm not very social. But um, and everybody here is wonderfully social. Like I really am amazed at how much power to socialize everybody here has. But. Um, uh, anyway, it kind of really affected me. And I think, and then I was thinking, oh no, um, I got burnt out. Like I kind of, I would like sit down to write, which is something I've done every single day since 1990. And, uh, uh, for four months, I just wouldn't be able to write or three and a half months. And, uh, I'm, I'm like, it's like my brain was, was saying, Hey man, you got punished the last time and I'm the brain. I'm taking care of you. I don't want to see you punished again. And so I just wasn't able to write. I was actually burnt out. And then I was thinking, man, can I talk about this? Can I say this? I'm usually, I say everything. Usually I'm really honest about everything. Like I, again, my rule is I can hurt myself and I should be honest about myself. But I don't hurt anybody else, but here I am. I've got a book coming out called skip the line. What are people going to think? Like, why should we listen to this guy if he gets burnt out? But again, like everybody, a, everybody gets burnt out. And maybe this is an experience. Every bad experience is material in terms of writing or, or, or I'm also a stand up comedian. So in terms of comedy and, and even in terms of business. And, um, so everything's material and, you know, I'm, tr I actually am trying to use the techniques in my books to kind of get out of this burnout. Yeah. I've never experienced this before. So well, it's related so to anxiety as well. Out of, did you fall out of love with it or did it just become too scary and hard for you? I don't know. I mean, I don't think I fell out of love with it because I, I, I rarely fall out of love with anything that I fall in love with over the years. And that's the, that's kind of the point of Skip the Line, really, is that you should pursue your passions and everyone's going to tell you you can't do it. You're too old. You can't make money. Um, but the reality is I've kind of proven them all wrong. And so have many other people that I know, like all the hundreds of thousands of podcast guests that I've had. And um, uh, but. I don't know. The thing about burnout, I realize I've never had this happen to me before. The thing about it is that you, you don't really know what's happening. I don't know what's going on. I just don't, I just sit down and I play chess 24 hours a day or not 24 I, I, hours. I have a day, noticed from your Twitter feed, a there's a lot of chess there. There's a lot of chess on Twitter, man. <laughs> yeah, for me or for everybody? For you, for you. <laughs> oh yeah. And here's the thing is that I haven't even been on Twitter that much. Like I used to do a lot of stuff on Twitter. I guess lately I've been, well, what I've been doing is I, I maximize what I'm doing in my burnout. So I, um, rather than just play chess mindlessly, which is what I think a lot of people do is I used to be very strong at chess. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to use this time of burnout somewhat productively. Yeah. And, uh, I used to be very strong. I used to study the game very seriously and, and play in tournaments and win them and, and all that kind of stuff. But when you haven't studied something in 23 years, 1997 was the last time I took serious lessons and played in tournaments, uh, you get worse. Like if you play golf and you haven't played in 23 years, your handicap is going to get much worse just by definition even. And your, your muscles atrophy. And so I decided, okay, I'm going to use this time productively. I'm going to... I'm going to use the techniques and skip the line the same way I've used it to be a better entrepreneur, investor, writer, stand-up comedian, whatever, podcaster. I'm going to be I'm going to get back to where I was in skill level at chess in, you know, record fast time and I'm not only that I'm going to be better than I ever was before. That was my goal. So I decided to take this burnout and use it productively. So that's what I've been doing. And part of that is I don't just play the game. I also have to part of the skip the line is 
what are the what does the landscape look like what does the industry look like and yes there's a chess industry and can you monetize being a chess player and it turns out yes you can and so you know that's when i started going on twitch and and so I learn, I'm using this time to basically learn all these amazing things I didn't know before, including um, Twitch, streaming, the world of that. Because uh, more people now watch chess on Twitch than watch Fortnite. It's like amazing. And um, uh, and so, so far, I've gotten better than, I've gotten as good as I was before at the very least. And now I'm aiming to get better than I ever was before. And I use all the techniques in the book. So I can now, at least I can come out of this burnout with this story of, of something I did. This is, this is what I did during my burnout summer. And, and everybody's uh, focused on, on the pandemic or whatnot. But can I ask, so this, I mean, this, this great book, skip the line. This is what you've you. been referencing. Um, now it's, it's issued in, in 21. So when did you write this before the burnout, before the article or? After? Oh yeah. Yeah. I wrote this. I wrote this like last, you know, let's say November, 2019 to yeah. May, 2020. Okay. And it really, it really came in handy by the way, during the pandemic because so many people got laid off they realized hey the only way i mean you know they need to skip the line because they need to finally pursue their interests and passions because they just got 55 million people got laid off so yeah. people have to kind of take action and, and it turned out skip the line was the perfect book for that with all the because i have methods not only for like skipping the line in terms of can i get into the top one percent of the world in something i love very quickly because like for instance i seven years ago i decided i wanted to do stand-up comedy and everyone was telling me you can't skip the line in this you know we've been we did this for ten thousand hours and and you know blah, blah, blah. I, I have to share something with you so yes. so i know that i know that you're a co-owner of stand-up new york yeah according to wikipedia which is cool i was so surprised to see your story in the introduction of the book about comedy because i love I love this this fake story that you broke. So I have been telling people for about maybe eight years now, I heard this story from a comedian. I love studying comedy. I've never gotten on stage, but I love studying the craft of comedy. And yeah, I heard me a comedian, too. I heard a comedian say the very thing in your book, which is, hey, man, this guy came up to me and he basically said, listen, listen, there's different cohorts. There's different generations of people. If you step into line and you do your time, eventually you will get to the front of the line. But if you step out of line and you decide to come back, you have to start at the back. And I've always used that story to remind myself to keep my head down and to, and to be patient and to be focused. And then I get your book and I'm like, wait a minute, not only did you not go the direction I thought you were going, which is the classic line of like, of like step in the line, stay in line and your time will come. You want to shatter this whole thing. I've been saying it for eight years and I love it. <laughs> yeah, because this, you know, I was 46 years old and, and, and everybody was saying, oh, you can't do this, you're too old or you gotta do the 10,000 hour rule, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, but I love this. And I, and like, like you probably, I, I spent so much time studying the craft, particularly when I started doing it, but even before then, I just always loved it. And, uh, and I, when I study a craft, I really break it down. Well, I, I describe kind of how I do that in the, in the book. And I, I wasn't going to let any tell me, anybody tell me you can't do that. I loved going on stage and making people laugh. I, I did it last night and uh, here in Miami. And... Uh, 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 and by the way, that's after a four month break because I got even burnt out. I got burnt out on everything. And, but, but, but I realized, okay, there's not a 10,000 hour rule that I have to pay attention to. And, and nobody else can tell me I can't do something or I can't skip the line or this is what the line looks like if you want to succeed. Like all of that's BS. Like life is short. So if I want to do this, I'm going to do it. And that's what I've done. You know, I went from being, a computer programmer to a writer to I, making a TV show to uh, uh, starting a company to running a, a hedge fund, which I didn't know yeah. anything about. <laughs> and then, you know, professional writing books and then writing kind of other kinds of books. And I've written all sorts of books on every topic and then doing a podcast and being an investor and starting businesses. So 
everybody, every step of the way in, with each thing told me you can't do this or there's the 10,000 hours or there's a line that you have to follow and don't try to skip the line. And so that's really where this book comes from, Skip the Line, is that, okay, I want to be a stand-up comedian. Here's the practices I have to put in place in order to be in the top one percent in the world like that's the goal always you can't really monetize if you're not you can't do it if you're not in the top one percent in the world that doesn't mean the top 10 but it means the top 10 people but it does mean you know the 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 top uh one percent which is important and uh you know furthermore you have to be able to monetize. You have to you have to know the industry. Even if not, if you're not monetizing, you have to know the industry enough that, you know, it's it's one thing if you're funny. It's another thing getting on stage at comedy clubs. So you have to know how the industry works so that you can get on stage and do the thing you love. Um, you know, if if you know if you're into games, well, and you decide that Twitch is the thing you're going to do, how do you do it? What what, what is a good twitcher look like and you know all these fun things so you know it's been it's been an interesting process and i love getting good at things like again mastery is like a key to uh, to happiness really is when you feel like you've mastered something that that's hard for others you've i mean you just rhymed off all the different paths you took like from from this career to that career to selling this to going broke and making it back and writing books you're you you come across as very eclectic with a lot of different things that you're into. Is it, is it curiosity that drives you to all of these different things? Is it, is it boldness? Is it that you get bored easy? Like, like what has, uh, what, what has led you down this path of all of these different things? I don't think, I don't think it's curiosity because curiosity comes afterwards. So if you love something, the way you one of the ways you learn is by being curious about it in in unique ways so you you be cur- you, you become curious in ways that nobody else has become curious before and that's build build your unique voice and that's how you succeed and you know life is good um it's more like i try something and and, and there's this notion of experiments in the book that right? instead of the ten thousand hour rule you you do experiments to get good but you also do experiments to find out what you're interested in so somebody said to me um hey you want to get on stage and do some stand-up comedy and most people would say no way in hell Uh, what like why would i (laughs) right and also most like i i was a fan of comedy ever since the 90s and i was thinking should i do it i really love it but i was terrified like it would seem like the most terrifying prospect in the world to do stand-up comedy but for whatever reason now i have a different mindset where what what's the harm just a bunch of people don't think i'm funny and that's that and uh, and I always want to do it. So it's not like I'm going to die doing this or anything. So, so you try things, you can't think your way to, um, success. Like you can't say, I think I would like to do comedy. So I'm going to focus on it for a couple years and then I'm finally going to try it. Right. Like you have to do things in order to actually know whether this is possible for me, whether you like it, you can't think that you like it. You have to do it and then like it. And so I went up on stage and I loved it. I mean, it was like the best thing ever, making people viscerally laugh. Like, it was amazing. And there's no harder skill, actually, that I've ever learned uh, than stand-up comedy. It's it's just an amazing thing. And, uh, Do you think uh, you're good at it yet? Well... Uh, good's a relative term. You know, I don't like to think I'm, I always like to think I'm in the learning stage on everything. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I've performed all over the country. I have gigs lined up in in the next month in Kansas City, in Cleveland, in Cincinnati, in Philadelphia. Uh, right before the pandemic, I toured all over the Netherlands. And so, you know, I'm good enough to do, and I, and the guy I tour with is like a living legend of comedy. And so, yeah, I think I'm good enough that, um, that, I, that I could appreciate the nuances of it. And I think when you first, it, it, when you first try something, you can't always appreciate the, the nuances of what you're doing because you don't know enough. And it's when you, it's when you really study something that, you realize, oh, I see what 
Louis C.K. is doing here. I see what Dave Chappelle is doing here. It's not just, you realize it's not just the joke. They're doing all these other like techniques. Oh, there's a and- lot of mechanics to like making sure that, you know, so my favorite comedian is, well, I have two, and they happen to be British. I hope you're not offended. No, but no. Jimmy Carr, Jimmy Carr yeah, he's is great. just like the one liner, man. Like, like no one can put out one line jokes and stack them more and more and more upon each other than than that man like like you think he's done and he just keeps going it's it's crazy but he talks about he talks about the misdirection right like 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 that that the best part of a joke is that everybody knows that you're going one way but then you take it a different way and so oh. i i love that kind of the mechanics of it oh my god you got to you know, I think there's like the 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 slightly older generation of one liner guys, which is like Stephen Wright and Mitch Hedberg. But you gotta check out Anthony Jeselnik if you haven't already. Yes, <laughs> yes, I've heard him on podcasts and stuff. He's a, he's a funny person. Oh my god, like his misdirection is like no other. Like, um, can I tell you an Anthony Jeselnik joke? I won't give it the the uh, same treatment he does, but I, I I I this is an example of him, and you'll you'll appreciate the the one liner ability. Like he said, um, I and I won't do it exactly, and I and I won't do it good. So just keep that in mind. I'm just describing the joke. He says, um, uh, I I I take care of a kid in Africa. I every month I send seventy five cents, and that's enough money to to feed that kid, to school that kid, to clothe that kid, but it's it's nothing compared to how much it costs me to send him there. Yep. <laughs> uh, usually, usually my family gets mad because I say that was really funny. Yeah, and well, I don't laugh. Well, no, no, but, but but that was really funny. I actually laughed. <laughs> that that's a that's well, also those comedians hardly ever laugh too. So maybe you're a natural comedian. But like that, it's the misdirection. It's almost like a puzzle. Like what's how is he going to end this? Like is he a good guy or is yeah. he his true colors here? And um, but uh, uh. <laughs> You know, it's it's interesting. Can I ask you? So, so while we're talking about comedy, and this might overlap even with our own personas and our own abilities, there, I I love British comedy, and the way I've heard it described is the difference between uh, British comedy or sitcom or whatever it is, and uh, an American comedy, is that uh, American comedy, everybody dumps on the person, but they still come out looking like a hero, and in British comedy, everybody dumps on the person. And that's the joke. That's it. Like, like it's just a bunch of, of mis- like people having miserable things happen to them. And that's life. And, and in America, it's like we show up still being the hero. Um, I don't know what it is, but I gravitate towards that like more miserable, grumpy side of things. I don't know if you do the same thing in your comedy or not. Yeah. And, uh, well, I think I do a little bit sometimes, you know, there, there's like several different styles. Like you look at Seinfeld uh, as, as a classic example, he's like, what's the deal with hotels? And, you know, so he's sort of like smarter than everybody in his comedy. Uh, and I think that's his, his style. Uh, but, um, you know, I think everybody everybody's got a different approach, and you know, Louis C.K. is a more of like a miserable guy when he does comedy. Dave Chappelle is a smart guy, so he's smarter than everyone else when he does comedy. And so, I just think you have different styles. And what's your style? Uh, I think I tell. I think in general, it's hard for me to pull off being stupid, but uh, just because of the way I look, you have to kind of work with what you have. And and unfortunately, I look smarter than I am. <laughs> like I used to go around in a park and nobody would know, like there would be chess players, for instance, and no one would know who I was uh, if I was in a new city or whatever. And n- everyone would refuse to play me just because of the look, way I look. You look like some kind of Russian grandmaster or something, right? Yeah. Yeah, I, I look like I play a lot better than I do. And, you know what? You you look like, and I, uh, gosh, I, I I hope this isn't overly friendly. You look like you would be perfectly cast as um as like the the guy in Apollo thirteen or the right stuff who runs in with the folder, who's like, here's the answer. That's yeah. that's the look that you've got. We've been tinkering in the lab. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> look, chief, look what we found. <laughs> we, we we found it. That's that's you. You got that really smart guy look about you. And then and then some crew cut general. Not now, Wilbur. We're dealing with some real serious problems. No, but chief, listen. If you put the 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 you know the bio connector connected to the fluid yeah, yeah. you know mechanics thing, we'll solve the problem. <laughs> what that's you. you. So you so you play you play up on that in uh, in your comedy. Yeah. So I'll, I'll sometimes I'll talk about the news and I'll be like, really, that happened. And um, and uh, but other times I'll try to be I'll, I'll act like smart, but clueless. So, uh, you know, I'll say something like to my, you know, uh, uh, like, you know, about my kids. I have like five kids. So I'll say something about one of them. You know, don't try who t somebody one of my kids will say, hey, you always should always pursue your passions. And I'll say, like, well, who told you to do that? That's horrible advice. Like, you know, Hitler pursued his passion of being an artist. And look what happened. Like, look what happened then. And just be OK with being mediocre. You're mediocre, not Four out of five people are not above average or four out of 10 people are not above average. You're not above average. I'm, and and then the audience would be like, oh, what are you? I'm just being a good dad, like a good dad should be honest. And so it kind of I'll know a lot of facts and I'll share a lot of facts, but I'll act kind of clueless at the end of that, like that the facts are not really serving me well. Yeah, <laughs> I love that. Uh, just at the end of your book, you actually talk about the lessons that you give your kids and and perhaps they're a collection of things from your past books but there are a few that stuck out at me and so you know in the essence of skip the line you know the first one is always go to the place least crowded that's that's your number one that's your number one out of all of these great lessons at the end of the book why why is that the thing and, and perhaps it's even again the essence of skip the line but why is that the thing that you recommend people do well if you go, let's say, this is a very interesting question. I've been thinking a lot even recently about this and, and thinking of new ideas with it. Um, it, it, it. Look at like the story of Betamax and VHS. So for people who don't know, VHS was the a, a tape like that you'd put into oh, a... Do we have to describe what a VHS tape is? I guess I we think do. we do because I, I, do. I don't know if my kids... Well, I guess my kids have used VHS, but never. But but my, when they were my, little, my kids used to call them square D, those black square DVDs. That's what they used to call them. <laughs> yeah, and like, but there was a technology at the time that was better, and it was yeah. called Betamax. Yeah. And um, and so I always, I always think about that story because it's not good enough to be better at something. You have to like nobody knows the difference between ten percent better. Like let's say, let's say I'm, uh, let's say Ernest Hemingway is a ten percent better writer than F. Scott Fitzgerald. No matter how you measure it, even though I don't know how you would measure that, but let's just say, uh, no, or, or even let's just say something which could be ranked. Let's say somebody's a ten percent tennis player than someone else, and that you can rank. There's a ranking system, so you can see by the ranking system that so and so is ten percent better. But if I were watching them play against other people. Uh, not against each other where you could tell again, but I would not be able to tell the difference between the number one tennis player in the world and the number 100 tennis player in the world. There would be no way for me as a, let's call it as a civilian in tennis, there would be no way for me to determine who is, uh, who is better. Uh, and I think that's true for most things. It's not good enough to be 10% better. You have to also be different. And that you could tell. If someone um, has a two-handed forehand and is just winning every game, I'll say, oh, that's unusual and different. Or if, if someone uh, was a comedian but always raps his jokes, I would say, oh, that's different. And so you, you, have, to be, you have to be different, I, I think, to, to succeed. And that's why, and you only get to be different if you, if you, first off, you have to know completely the history uh, and styles. You have to study the mechanics of whatever industry you're in, whether it's business or comedy or writing or whatever. And then you have to have a unique approach that no one else has ever done. Now you can start off just trying to get good at the basic skills, but eventually if you want to succeed and be outstanding and, and, and be known, mm. it's not, a, you don't have to be 10% better than everyone else. You have to have at least one thing that's very, very different than everyone else. And that's really important. Mm. You know, when I was, um, 
I had this thought a, a bunch of years ago, but I, I tell it to younger people now who are starting businesses that when, you know, when you graduate, let's say you graduate high school or you graduate college or whatever, you're entering your career. All you want is to, is to be as good as everyone else. Like, yeah. like when you start something new, you just, you, and this is what people fall into. They go, I'm just as good as them. Why aren't they picking me? Right. Like you just desperately want to be seen as good as everyone else. And then you hit a point where you're like, Oh, I want to be better than everyone else. And then you, and then you spend all of this effort trying to make yourself different than everyone else. Uh, the advice I give, and I don't know the tools yet, but I think they're in here in the book is, is just leapfrog that whole idea of trying to be like everyone else. Get the courage up to be different right from the start. You're going to make mistakes, but you're going to make mistakes anyway. And being like everyone else feels like forward momentum. And yet all you're doing is just moving yourself into kind of that mediocre or middle position. Like there's no reason to pick you. There's no reason to like you. There's no reason to do anything. You're not, you're not different. Yeah. And like, well, think about like a writer like Kurt Vonnegut, for instance, Kurt Vonnegut's a great writer. Um, but what really is appealing to him is that he really is different from everyone else. Like his writing style is extremely different. He's got I don't, a different... I don't know that writer. What, what makes him? Oh, oh Kurt Vonnegut. Um, he wrote a book, Cat's Cradle. He wrote Slaughterhouse Five. He, okay. he wrote all these like interesting, interesting little books. And, um, and he really is like, but he but he says though his advice to writers is first learn the rules of grammar and then get different than everyone else so because first you have to know the basic skills like steve jobs had to know what a phone was and then he made a smartphone right so you know there, there there's kind of that idea that you have to you have to master do you remember do you remember the day that was announced i remember where i was sitting I was sitting, I was sitting in my, I had a Saturn. I had a Saturn back then in 2007 when it was announced. And I remember sitting at a red light, hearing it on the radio. Do you remember when the iPhone was announced? No, no. I, I remember thinking how stupid it was. Who's going to want to touch a button on, on a screen when BlackBerry had it all figured out already? <laughs> like, yeah. And I used to love BlackBerry. You're right. <laughs> yeah. There, there's, some, there's something that changed really quick, but you're right. I mean, Steve Jobs was like, I'm going to go ahead and I mean, he's been and look, a phone, the iPhone is, is it's very interesting actually using this as an example. Now I think about it. First off, the iPhone is 99% of the architecture of an iPhone is a phone. It's just basically, it's a phone. Yeah. And there's, it's not like a new kind of phone. It communicates the exact same way as every other phone on the planet. And then there are some new things in it. Like it's a music player. It's a video player. It's a, uh, uh, you can play games on it now. And, uh, uh, so, so all of this stuff is, is important, but what made the iPhone so successful was, the first thing was is that it was very different. There was a lot of things different about it. And the second thing was is that is Steve Jobs' personality. He had this amazing personality for um, launching these products, which is that that's even a chapter in the book. You, it's not good enough to like a lot of people write books. Oh, here's how to learn something. It's not good enough to just learn something. Like you said, you have to be different, but also you have to know the in, you have to know how to present things. You have to know how to persuade people that you're idea is interesting and that they should take a chance on you. So there's a lot that goes into success. It's not just learning the skills. It's, it's being part of that ecosystem and, and learning it and, and knowing what's needed. And then, and then of course, uh, being, um, having that persuasion ability, having that mystique, having like the Steve Jobs magic. Like he, had, he certainly had certain, uh, you know, he would describe a product and everybody would be like, ooh, ah, ooh. And then, and then he would say, uh, and then you'd think he's done. And then he'd say, but there's one more thing. And that would there's be like- There's one the more thing. thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and people would clap towards the end of his life because they knew something magical was coming. Yeah, and it always was. I mean, look, I have an iPhone and I, and I did not for a while, but I finally got one and it's like the best thing ever. <laughs> so, so, so if I can ask, and I have to reference this because I won't remember all the words. I usually try to- to remember these things, but the, the thought of putting yourself out there and, and doing things differently and breaking social norms and, you know, not following the path that all the comedians say of, you know, first you're going to start with, you know, this, and then you're going to do five minutes and then five minutes becomes eight and all of this stuff. You want to skip the line, but, but you reference here uh, two books that you speak to about risk. Uh, the books are fooled by randomness. Oh, sorry. I guess there's a few, uh, the black swan, anti-fragile and skin in the game. Yeah. And fooled by randomness also. Yeah. 
what what is it about those books and what is it about risk that 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 you know have has shaped the way that you approach things cuz yeah. again you seem like the kind of guy who's pretty comfortable with these things well that's just it i don't like risk at all everyone says oh but you're a risk taker I hate, I've gone broke many, many times. Like I've, I, my first company, I sold it. I had money for the first time in my life. I mean, I, I grew up with no money and I had money for the first time in my life and I had millions of dollars. And then within a year or two, I was dead broke. Like I had $143 left to my name. And, and you sold it in the nineties for 15 million, right? Yeah. And, and then I was, it's a lot of money to move through. <laughs> Yeah, I was the worst on the planet. And I was I got so depressed and that's a whole other story. But but here's the thing is that you know, and I, and, I, and it happened to me again and again and again. I've gone broke like four times after making money. And I'm like, what the heck is going on? And so there was a lot of things going on, but one thing was my attitude towards risk is that I the with anything worth doing, the rewards are there. Like if you say I'm going to invest in the stock market, a lot of people have made a lot of money in the stock market. Like the rewards, we know the rewards are there in the stock market. If you're a writer, the rewards are there as a writer. There's many successful writers. If you're an entrepreneur, the rewards are there. But most people, they know the rewards are there. They know, oh my God, this is my big chance. I'm going to make a lot of money, this, this. But they don't take into account at all risk. And once you know the rewards are there, that's that's okay. That's 1% of the path. The other 99% is completely about mitigating risk. That's it. Mitigating and risk. It, yeah, getting rid of all the risk. Mm -hmm. And the, 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 the idea is if you can stay in the game, you're going to win the game. And if, you, if you're like... Oh my God, I heard about this stock. I'm going to put everything I own into it because now is finally my chance to, to make it big. If that's your attitude, that almost sounds like you have like, a, that you're a risk taker, you have an abundance mindset, but actually it's the opposite. You're, you're, you have a scarcity complex in that you think this is my only chance to make money. So I got to put everything into it. And you're not really taking into account risks. And it's not like you're a risk taker. You don't even know what the risks are. And so, for instance, with investing, you got to do due diligence before you invest in something. Um, uh, with uh, with everything in life, you have to, uh, do, you know, let's say you're starting a business. What? Why should it, Why should anybody in the world pay attention to your business and not the 6,000 other uh, successful businesses in this area or, or whatever it is? So, so risk is always by far the most important thing you can you can do to manage you know to 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 manage mastery to manage getting good at something and you but, know but having having had these ups and downs and all of these w wildly different experiences how do you manage risk now well so for instance i always assume i'm the stupidest person i know like without a doubt I never make the mistake of thinking I'm smart at what I'm trying to do, whether it's comedy or investing or entrepreneurship. So like as an example, since I've started thinking about this in this way, I've um, I've been I've, I've been a very successful investor. It's like that's how I make most of my living and money. And here's how I do it. I won't invest in something unless someone smarter than me is investing at the same time as me. And so um, I remember my first big deal that I made a lot of money on, I invested in in 2007. And it was a company that did Facebook marketing for uh, big uh, Fortune 500 companies. And uh, I, I wouldn't have invested. I, I knew the CEO, he was a friend of mine. I wouldn't have invested except for the fact that um, Peter Thiel, who was the first investor in Facebook, was also investing at the same deal terms as me. So I figured, okay, he's he knows Facebook better than anyone. This is a Facebook-related company. Um, so, 
he must have done his due diligence. He likes this. Worst case is he could probably convince Facebook to buy it. So I'll invest. So I always, every company I invest in, there has to be someone smarter than me who's done a lot more work on the topic than me um, investing as well. So that's how I mitigate the risk. Like if Warren Buffett was investing in a company, what am I going to do? Am I going to say, Warren, you're such an idiot. Like how could you invest in this company? You know, Warren, Warren, Warren. No, I'll. I don't even need to know what the company does, and but I'll. But invest. their risk tolerance must might be higher than you because, because they just have more cash on hand, or they're willing to do riskier things than you. I mean, absolutely, you're That's putting a part- lot of trust in outsourcing your decision making. You, you're absolutely right, and it's funny. A lot of people don't bring that up, but that is a risk to taking this approach is that they don't care if they lose that much money. So you have to get a sense, well, do they care? And why do they like this? You know, because sometimes there's a lot of reasons people might care about it. Like sometimes it's just, are they doing a favor for a friend? But most of the time these guys are billionaires because they really care a lot about making, squeezing every dollar out of everything. And so, but yeah, I have to take that into account and I have to look, is this a risk in doing this deal? Is that they don't really care? And, uh, uh, so, so it's all about risk management. The rewards are always there, but, uh, but you win when you, when you take into account all the risks, that's, that's a, the important point. You know what? This is a much smaller example, but I got laser eye surgery a few years ago and I typically get, I, I would typically be afraid to do something like that. Uh, I went to my sister and said, Hey, you've looked into this, who, who, which, which organization, what type of laser eye surgery would you do? And she said this and I asked another person, they said the same thing. I asked another person, they said the same thing. So I just booked and I went in they said, do you have questions? I said, no. They said, do you want to know about us? I said, no. Like I, I asked three people in my life and all three people said this. So this is what I'm doing and it costs what it costs. When can we book it? And they were so confused because I just, rather than worry about it and do all the research, I trust these three people. So I'm just going to do what they say. And it saved a lot of time. <laughs> yeah. It does save a lot of time. And it's, a, you know, everything is about energy also. So like if I'm going to spend a lot of time researching some deal when Peter Thiel's already in it. So what am I going to do that he hasn't already done or Warren right. Buffett's in it? So what is it? What am I going to do? That's a waste of energy. I could be writing, for instance. I could be improving my life in some way. I could be getting better at things. And, you know, uh, everything is about energy. Yeah, we know for a fact we have a finite amount of, we begin the day with a limited amount of energy. And when we run out of it, we fall asleep again till the next day. So here, here's what people could spend time with their, uh, you, you, to be great at something, to be the top 1% in the world at something, you need a lot of energy. So if you spend some of that energy filled with anxiety, filled with you're, you're arguing with your spouse, you're sick in bed because you haven't been so healthy lately. If, if you spend your uh, uh, energy on the wrong things. When it comes time to um, getting good at, at this incredibly difficult thing to get good at, and anything worth getting good at is incredibly difficult to do, almost by definition, or else everybody would be doing it. Uh, uh, if you spend all your energy on these other things, y- you won't get. You won't be as good as the person who is fully ready to devote their energy to the to getting great at this activity. And by the way, that mean that's the reason. The reason you need to be passionate or obsessed with what you you want to master is all. It's not about like oh, it's so nice to do what you love doing. It's all about energy. It's it, it, like I am never going to get up on a stand up stage if I don't absolutely love this because it is the worst thing in the world. <laughs> like it is not. Oh, but that's another misconception people have. Oh, but I love doing it. And why do you love doing it? It makes me happy. No, it doesn't. Anything worth doing will not make you happy. But uh, again, by definition, you'll be miserable most of the time. If you if you are a young, if you're the U.S. junior tennis champion, for instance, and you want to get better at uh, tennis, you are going to be a very unhappy guy because, or a woman, because you're going to lose, while you're getting better, you're going to lose most of your matches or at least 50% of your matches because you keep moving up the ladder. Yeah. Uh, 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 first, you move up the ladder very quickly and then you re- you reach the level of your co- of the, your strongest competition and now you start losing and losing is horrible. 
it's the worst feeling if you love something. Oh, I'm obsessed with tennis and now I'm losing. So you've got to love what you're doing. You got to be able, you might say to yourself after you lose a match, ah, I hate this. I'm never going to do it again. But the next morning, wake up and you're like, you know what? Uh, I'm gonna, I know what I did wrong. I'm going to get back on that court today and practice it because you love it. And, and you don't have to spend energy convincing yourself, oh God, I got to go back to the court again. You don't need that energy. Uh, everybody else who's a loser will need that energy but you will have the energy to to go forward with the things you love and that's why if you love something you'll be better than the person who doesn't love it and needs to use part of their energy convincing yeah. themselves just oh to i gotta it, sit down and off. write a novel i want to write a novel so girls will like me and that person won't succeed okay that might so, be a good in, initial motivation by the way but you need to ultimately love it and you only learn that by doing it you can't you can't learn if you love it if you don't do it I, I love talking to you so much. So, so, so in August, you have this article that goes sideways. You mentioned that you're feeling burnt out about writing. You're feeling burnt out about stand up a little bit. Um, how did you, or how are you going to get over this writing burnout and get back to doing the thing that you love? Well, the only way to do it, and and by the way, the the real honest answer is I don't know because this is honestly never happened to me about. Maybe it's happened to me a little bit when I've, I'm not like really a natural business guy. So when I've had some setbacks in business, I got a little burnt out on that because it's just not, I don't really, I'm not like obsessed with business, even though I, I, I'm. Okay. Real quick, real quick side note. What are you obsessed with then? I'm, I'm, I've always been obsessed with writing Mm -hmm. and I'm obsessed with stand-up comedy and chess and, and chess right now Uh, but every year i'm usually if you i can tell you since the age of six you throw out a year i could tell you what i was obsessed with i've always been a very obsessive person and um okay age of 32 what were you obsessed with age of 32 well i was (laughs) suffering through a big depression at the age of 32 but uh i got obsessed i got obsessed that's the age i got obsessed with investing i had never really invested before i and then i end up losing a lot of money investing and i'm like screw it i am gonna get good at this and i read a hundred books or more about investing i i wrote software to predict the stock market i got really good and uh uh, i read you know i read biographies i i studied what worked what didn't i got obsessed with investing And, and then again it's not enough to be good at investing because you can't really make wealth from just investing your own money. So then I wanted to start a hedge fund. So I got obsessed with the business, the industry of it. And so how do you set up a hedge fund? How do you raise money? What skills are needed for that, which are different skills than investing? And so that's the approach I cover and skip the line, which is that you gotta know the skills, but you also have to know the field. You have to be in the top 1% of knowing the field as well as the skills. And so, so yeah, 32 was, was investing and yeah, sure, I, I, that was a, so that was a side note. That was fun actually. Um, so I was asking, you know, you haven't done it yet, but, but how are you going to get back to writing? Yeah. So the only way is the same way you find out you're in, investing is in, in, that you're obsessed with something is you got to do it. I've got to just sit down and do it. There's no excuse. There's no, I'm not going to think my way out of burnout. I'm not going to think, man, I've got to do it because it's what I do. Like that just doesn't work. And so, uh, I've got to just sit down and do it. And when I sit down and do it, the reason why I say, I don't know, when I sit down and do it, I feel like my brain is saying, don't do it. Don't do it. Remember the last time. And I'm like, but this is what, this is what I've always done. This is what I love doing. And, and it's like some cognitive bias or something like you're going to get punished by the society if you do this. And so I think I've just got to do it a couple of times, realize it's okay. And then, cause I'm still obsessed with it. Like when I read a book, for instance, I, I, I have, I feel it kicks in. Like, I feel like, oh, that's what that writer is doing. Or, you know, and I like talking about writing. I, I like the topic of writing, um, but I'm just having a hard time doing so, it. So are you, like, like, and I know you haven't done this yet, but, but I can imagine you could sit down and you could say, okay, this is it. And you can write a practice one, crumple it up, throw it away and say, there we go. It's broken. Or you could say, no, I'm writing something and it's going out good or bad. You could, you could swing for the fences and just say, you know what? I know how bad it was last time. 
I can deal with that a second time. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and take round two of punches or you could play it super safe. What do you think you're going to do? I think I've got to just sit down and do it. I don't know how, I don't know what else is I'm going to do. <laughs> we don't know what like, will come from it, but there's no strategy. There's no game, just action. I, I did do some writing for the first time in, in four months or three and a half months about, uh, when, when the the day the book came out, my skip the line came out on February twenty third, and I really had to write about it. You know, I have a big email list, I have a social media following. I really had to write about it just to inform people who pay attention to my writing that um, I'm writing. And uh, this was so I did do some writing, and it was and it was good. Like it wasn't bad. Like a lot of times, if I haven't written in or if I haven't written something seriously in a while, I feel a little rusty and it's not a good, but I felt like this was, was good. And so I know I've got the skills still. They haven't atrophied like other skills often do very quickly. Um, but, you know, also there's a factor that I've gotten obsessed with something else. I'm, I'm cheating on writing right now with oddly with chess <laughs> and I'm rationalizing it by saying, well, I'm using, I'm doing an experiment. I'm seeing if the skip the line techniques can get me better than I ever was at chess, but that's really just rationalization. And it works though. I have gotten better <laughs> than I ever was, but, or at least I've gotten as good as I was, which t which I wasn't before. I, the old, the old me from four months ago, the, the old me from 23 years ago could beat the me from four months ago, four times out of five. But now it would be about a break even match. And my goal is to uh, be better. So it's actually really encouraging. Cause one of my biggest, one of my biggest fears is always like, why put in the, like, so like health is a great example. Why put in the effort of getting that body that you want when you just know it's going to disappear as you get older? Why put in the effort of, of hitting X achievement when in the future you might look back and, and think, you know, hopefully you've achieved bigger and better, but, but to know, but just to, just to know this, like, Hey, you know, 23 years ago, I did this. I put four months of effort in, and I think I'm back to where I am. I mean, we could apply that to all kinds of areas of our life. Oh yeah. That's why, I mean, that's why I wrote the book, skip the line, because <laughs> even, even in chess, you know, the, the 10,000 hour rule, Malcolm Gladwell popularized it in the book outliers. And it's this idea that, and I'm sure your listeners have heard of it, but it's this idea that if, if you really want to be, if you really want to master something, you need to spend 10,000 hours of what's called deliberate learning, getting good at it. And this was like paralyzing me particularly when it came to comedy, because I was already like, I'm 53 now, I was like 46 years old. And I'm like, how am I gonna put 10,000 hours into comedy to be just to be, you know, as good as other people who I admire. And I realized, and by the way, I was part of the initial experiments in the early 90s that where Anders Ericsson developed the 10,000 hour role because I was a chess master and he did a lot of studies on the difference between amateurs, masters, and grandmasters. And uh, and the grandmasters spent 10,000 hours, the masters spent you know X amount of hours and the amateurs did nothing. And um, uh, uh, you know, and I'm like, this is crazy. I'm not gonna spend 10,000 hours now, I'm 46 years old. I'm not gonna be 80 years old when I finally get good at something. And so that's really what led to this book because I started thinking, well, what about all the other times I didn't spend 10,000 and, and A, I'm not trying to be in the top 10 in the world. I'm just trying to be in the top 1%, which is very different. So it's less hours, but B, I realized ex through, through the use of experiments, like for instance, you talked about Jimmy Carr who, who does these one-liners. So I felt like when I started comedy, I felt like my one-liners were not so good. And so, so I did an experiment. I went on a subway car and every stop I did stand up, I went to a different car and on the subway, the New York City subway system, and I would do comedy to the audience. So it was an experiment in dealing with A, a hostile audience. You can't get more hostile than the New York City subway. Yeah. And B, they're all getting off the subway every stop. So I had to have really tight one-liners. Yeah. Uh, and so that was an experiment I did to see if it would help me get better. The great, great benefit of experiments is, as opposed to waiting for the next time I'm on stage and then taking the risk that, oh, I'm going to bomb because I'm practicing one-liners for the first time, so they're never going to book me again. And you have to be respectful of the booker and, and, and the business and so on. And, uh, 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 
you know, it was a good way to skip the line on one-liners. I got immense practice right away doing one-liners. And I don't know what I want to say if I got good at it that moment, but I certainly got years and years worth of effort better because I performed like 20 times to 20 different groups of hostile audiences, Just a bunch of one-liners. Turning over every few stops. And by the way, I would make them up on the fly. That was another thing I was practicing. So I did this like experiment. People think, oh, do you need money to do experiments? No, that cost me like a buck 25, whatever the cost of a subway token was. And that was it. And what was my downside? I, I, so an experiment is easy to set up, which this was, just go to the subway. Um, it's easy to set up. It's um, it's cheap. Uh, there's little downside. What was my downside? Is that a bunch of people in a subway would hate me. <laughs> and that's my downside, which is not, I don't care. Like, that's not so bad. And uh, my upside was enormous, which is that I'm going to be amazing at one-liners. Now, neither happened. Like, I, I, you know, the experiment even failed. I wasn't really that good at one-liners, but at least it got me better and it got me thinking about it and it put me in a difficult situation where I would learn to be better. And so the experiment, and by the way, a great thing about experiment is it's a story for the rest of your life. Like that's, a, I just told yeah. you the story and it's I a great it. story. People are like, I can't believe you did that. And so experiments are usually are interesting stories to tell later, even if they fail. There was no downside, there was infinite upside. And I even, I then even, I had such a fun time doing it. I then said, you know what? This reminds me of a late night show, but on a subway. So when you, whenever you do a cover of a song, for if you're a musician and you wanna do a cover of a song, you cha you take the entire song and you change one element. So let's say I want to do cool a cover of Coolio's Gangster's Paradise. Well, how about what if I do it in a 1920s type of honky tonk format? That's a legit cover. Or let's say I want to do a, a Bohemian Rhapsody by Queen. A cover. Well, let's say, you know, Freddie Mercury sings eight different octaves in Bohemian Rhapsody. So what if I have eight different people, eight different women do a different, sing a different, a, the, a different octave. Uh, yeah. Like when, when Freddie Mercury was singing this octave, I have this one. When Freddie Mercury sing singing this octave, I have this one. So these, so, so that's a cover changes one thing and it does it really well. So I was thinking to myself, this is, I can make a late night show where the one thing I change is I'm going to be on a subway. So I found a busker who played like garbage cans as drums and he was my musical guest. And then I had a friend of mine who had just written a book as my, you know, guest that I would interview and there was some audience interaction. And so I made like a whole kind of, um, you know, and it took me like half a day. So very little downside, easy to set up, no money. And I made like a whole late night show episode on the subway. And then I figured, okay, I'm just going to send this. It doesn't hurt. I'm going to just send this to an agent and see what they think. And so I did that. And he, he didn't, he didn't care about it. He didn't like it. <laughs> so, so experiments fail, but you don't, but look, what was the upside was, oh my you. gosh. The, yeah. It cost me nothing. And I learned a lot, by the way, I produced mm -hmm a show there and I learned about late night shows and, I, and this started my thinking about making covers of things and I, I I learned about I learned a lot more about comedy of course doing because I did the monologue was what my one liners part wa wa was and my upside was oh my gosh I have a TV show on a late night on NBC <laughs> that was my upside didn't work out that way but I you always learn something and it's a story and it's fun and it's experience every experience teaches you something about about life so that was that amazing uh last question real quick because we only have a minute left uh what's your favorite part of this book i know i know that you wrote it a year ago a, a little over that yeah no but, but i but, I but it always it there's always a fresh thing so what's 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 your favorite thing out of the book well i think i think the the overall favorite thing is that it proved to me and it's still proving to me that you can get good at something you thought was impossible to get good at mm. for whatever reason. And other people told you, you can't get good at this or you can't skip the line. You get really good at difficult things very fast. And, and you not only that, you can learn how to monetize it. And I've seen people do it. I've seen people use the techniques in this book to, to do exactly that. And um, 
But the favorite technique, maybe, well, there's one chapter about persuasion that I really like. Uh, so that that is an important um, chapter for me. And uh, uh, I don't know, I just enjoyed, these are all ex- techniques that I've personally used, whether it's yeah. the persuasion techniques. Like I see a lot of books about persuasion, like, oh, if you cl- cross your legs, when they cross their legs, they start listening to everything you say. I've tried all that. It doesn't work. And, um, uh, you know, the other, uh, so these techniques actually work for me and they're still working for me. Like, uh, like I say, I apply it to chess, which is an incredibly difficult game. And already I'm as good as I ever was before. And, uh, uh, but I like the idea of, my favorite chapter is probably the 10,000 experiment rule. The idea that you can beat out the 10,000 hour rule through this technique of experiments. That's incredibly valuable to know. And I didn't realize that for a long time. And I was so stressed, like, oh, I got to spend 10,000 hours to get good at this. And it just wasn't true. And experiments was a much more valuable and, and, and correct way to get good at something. Oh man, I loved that talk. Okay, key takeaways for me. Number one, limit risk and move a lot faster by using tiny, small, rapid experiments that they take no time, they cost no money, but you're gonna develop skills, you're gonna learn how and why things work or why they don't work. Do all of that stuff rather than wait for everything to come together just for your big one shot. Okay, number two, go out and try to touch and feel and experience and taste as many things as you can. It not only makes you a lot more interesting, but you'll never know how those interests will start to serve you later. And number three, if you find yourself struggling to move forward in one area of your life, rather than battle through giving a little bit of time and focus, take all of that energy, take all of that focus and move it to another area of your life that you're really excited about. You're still going to be making progress and you're going to be re- build your confidence in the process. Remember, those of us who have something to prove, we can show the world and we can show ourselves that we have what it takes to make it happen. But you have to think big. You've got to be bold and you must say yes. If you need more Next Level Conversations, you have got to watch the one, the only Iron Cowboy. Click on the link right over there. I'll see you there. Down to to gratitude and the things that we get to do. I don't have to go on a 140 mile bike ride. I don't have to do eco challenge. I get to do those things. Changes the mindset when you're out there suffering.